You're listening to a This Day original podcast. We have made English into that thing that if you can get past it, the kingdom of God is with you. The Japanese didn't do that. The Russians didn't do that. All sorts of other people didn't do that. We're quite sure that if the Nambudris came to Kerala in the 8th century, they would speak in Sanskrit as a mother tongue. It was no one's mother tongue at that time. A language which only has second language speakers is not a language with vitality. In Uzbekistan, they don't think of Babur as the emperor of India. They think of them as the first great Uzbek writer. Rajan Avati, they were way ahead of Hindi. They still call dialects of Hindi. Most of us tend to look at language as something utilitarian, a means of communication. But in Peggy Mohan's wonderful book, Wanderers, Kings and Merchants, she uses an almost detective-like manner to trace the history of India through the evolution of languages. Absolutely fascinating. Welcome to the Reader's Room, where I'm joined by Peggy Mohan to discuss this wonderful book. It explores the evolution of languages as well as how different languages from around the world have had an impact on our own. Hi, Peggy. Just let me say on my part as a reader how much I enjoyed reading Wanderers, Kings and Merchants. Thank you so much. Once you've read the book, it makes so much sense because it explores the connection between commerce and, um, and rule and um, begins with pre-Vedic times and brings us right to where we are sitting in the heart of Delhi. So uh, let me begin by asking, um, is Hindi a descendant of Sanskrit? Not really. Let me see how I put it. In my book, I describe Sanskrit as that mamaji that we have in our families, who we're all very proud of. He's so classy. And in our part of India, he reads Persian. He's a bit of a dilettante. He knows everything. But we're actually his sister's kids. And, or rather brother in this case, because... Sanskrit has uh, come into India through the male line. It was male migrants meeting local women. So we all have a trace of first Indians, a good strong trace on the female line. And the male line um, is the brother of Sanskrit, the Prakrits. The great, wonderful Mamaji who is Sanskrit, we'd love him to be our ancestor. We're so proud of him. But he isn't actually because he's sort of like a, a dead end, an evolutionary dead end, something very beautiful and polished. But we actually came down from the Prakrits. And what is the relationship between the Prakrits and Sanskrit? It's very similar to the relationship between most Indian English and standard English. One thing you'll hear very clearly if you listen, but not if you read, is there's an accent difference. Much of what people make a fuss about in Prakrit is an accent. Some Sandhi rules, which are a little bit older, maybe more Dravidian, um, not similar to the Sanskrit Sandhi rules. A few things leak in, which are new grammatical forms, which don't actually shake things up too much. It's like every time we say in Indian English, this is with me only, it's not wrong English. It's not wrong English, but it's pretty strange because it's actually an avoidance of the word ham, which doesn't exist in Indian languages. So similar things happened, which did not shake up Sanskrit too much, but it was just enough for you to know that this person is not quite us, the Vedic Brahmin men. But there was no, no problem at any time in, San, in Prakrit speakers understanding Sanskrit and vice versa. It's quite different from saying Hindi is different from Sanskrit. Now, that's a huge order of difference. Oh, more than yeah. So where did, where, did, uh, where did Sanskrit emerge from and where did the Prakrits emerge from? Earliest Sanskrit and the Sanskrit that was actually spoken as opposed to just uh, composed into the Rig Veda, probably came out of a fusion of people bringing in words and a certain sense of a grammatical structure and a few new things from India that they picked up. We don't know really what the first thing was. All we actually know for sure 
is the Rig Veda and that too, when it went into Samhitas. There's a good 700 years of history before that that we can only guess about. What did these people speak? How much closer was it to Prakrits? Um, what was it? Because they never wrote anything down. And uh, so I'm imagining from the way there are similarities to Avestan, Greek and Latin, that it must have been a language which had case endings, which we call Karaks in India. Um, a lot of declensions, you know, he, she and it has a different verb form. It had a particular past tense like Latin and Greek, which is different from what it got later and that and what Hindi has now. It was very straightforward European type language with certain important differences. Um, some words would look different. Ashvaha for from Equus. And Agni from Igmis. You could but you could see the Latin similarity. So there was clearly some place where they all were together. I will put my head on a block and say where that place was, except that I'm quite sure it was not India, because I don't get a sense from the way languages outside India evolved that they had a continuing Indian link going into them. Instead, I see all of them coming from one place and landing up somewhere. We don't, there's a lot that we don't know. We have to work it back forensically from what we see in the Rig Veda. And that's great fun. But remember, we're always only talking probabilities. There's always a one, two, five percent chance that we're wrong. You mentioned the word Samhita being very critical over here. I think you need to explain it for us. Okay. Approximately 700, I'm not sure of the date, 700 years after the very first um, parts of the Rig Veda, which is not Mandala 1, but actually 2 to 8, when those were actually composed, these people by then had drifted off into Shakhas, Brahmin families, here, there, and the next place. And meanwhile, wars were going on, uh, accommodations were being made. And sometimes 700 years later, the wars were resolved and the Kuru dynasty got set up. They thought, we want a good strong link between Brahmins and kings, which continues. You see it even in Kerala. You see it in many parts of India where the Brahmin is the advisor to the king. We need to find a way to make this relationship pakka. So what's better than the Shrauta rituals of the Rig Veda. Now, where to get them? So they sent out people. It must have been great being a linguist in those days. They were sent out without writing but memorization to meet all these different shakhas of Brahmins and uh, find out what they were doing. And they found quite a lot of differences. A lot of things got garbled. Some forgot a whole hymn. Some added two or three extra and they sat down among themselves and decided, this is what we heard. No, no, no. If it's ta, it was tish, ta, thi. And all of this was done then, and that became set in stone. So whatever was there before could have been quite a bit different. Many of us suspect that if, like, if it's from outside of India, it probably didn't have ta, ta, da, da, na at all. Because none of the languages outside of India, except if you're talking of Australian Aborigines and New Guinea Highlanders who were part of our migration out of Africa, no languages outside of India has this as an important, meaningful contrast. So we think it came in then. And 700 years is a goodly amount of time. People were speaking their Sanskrit, speaking their Prakrits, and the kind of people who went to collect the Rigvedic hymns and put them into what we call Samhitas and editions, uh, edit, edited volumes, and there were actually 21 of them, not just one. Um, these people were using the kind of um, knowledge of Sanskrit that is 700 years later. So they brought that in and fixed the Sanskrit and set it in stone so that people wouldn't be forced to remember it exactly like that. but So that's why we even work back from what 
has been given to us as the Shakalya Samhita, the only one that's still around, we tend to work back and see what could it have been if these people had just just arrived in India and hadn't had so much influence from local women, there weren't their own children who were bilingual, helping in the right in the composition. So we a lot of what we are doing is speculating back. What did the local people speak who met them for the first time? These must have been educated people. They must have been. So it's a whole picture of history that we're trying to get from just a text that we know a little bit about in terms of how it came together. This brings a lot of questions to my mind. The first is, very specifically, when you say set in stone, do you mean that this was written down on paper? Or no. inscribed on tablets? or Memorized. It was written in a, it was memorized in a way that forced them to keep repeating and repeating so that no phonetic detail even was lost. And that is part of the problem with Sanskrit. The phonetic detail is so important and so remembered that we sometimes forget it's not very important. Like important is important in the opposite of where, right? But in, in Sanskrit, that M, like in English, would be also written, but we know it's actually an N. So they kept a lot of this detail in memory. And though they later, very soon after, at the time of Parnini, got the option of writing, it was not exercised much. It's almost like a particular culture made a decision. That just like our neighbors or our predecessors somewhere were very into writing, we will not be. Or it's like saying, so-and-so eats meat, we will not eat it. There was almost like a decision taken that we will do this and do it well without writing, though we have writing. So the second question is by now, by the time of the summit, uh, had the retroflexive forms of dirt or dirt are not crept into the Sanskrit? See, it probably crept in immediately into the spoken form. If you think about it, if a Brit came here early on, before the British Raj, and had children, an Indian family, the children would have known very quickly that they speak English without retroflexion and Hindi with retroflexion. And another generation would start bringing it into their English. They might. Uh, not just their children, but there are all sorts of educated people around, interpreters, the kind of people who first meet the migrants tend to be a fairly sophisticated lot, and they would have picked up English with their local accent, which would include retrofraction. As we are doing it right now, we don't notice it, but when only Anglo-Indians, as a rule, don't have retroflexion, except one or two who are in politics, but put it, especially there. Uh, we don't even hear it, but most Indians, I even see a put with a, for heaven's sakes. Uh, so these people would have been doing it in spoken Sanskrit. In Prakrit, there was a little more. And, but you, it's possible to keep it out of your sacred texts. Like we know that with uh, the Mughals or the whole um, Muslim migration from Central Asia, People were able to speak Urdu with retroflexion, or the Indian languages with retroflexion. It never crept into Persian, partly because Persian was always written. And though there's a way to write a retroflex when you write Urdu, you put a funny little thing looking like a thorn on top of the letter. Um, they didn't do it to Persian. So it's actually very interesting that it happened to Sanskrit. It could just as well not have happened. So if Sanskrit was a written language already, then it may have been slightly less... Influenced. Influenced, yes. I'm thinking it might have been. Also, you have to remember about 700 years of living in little families, far from the hustle bustle of real society. That's why in my second chapter, I looked at Kerala. But what is a Nambudri life? How possible is it to live in Kerala and be completely oblivious of what Brahmins do all day long? So were these Brahmins as important? But you can look in Kerala 
And uh, imagine a trolley tapper doesn't really know too much about what's going on in the earlums where the Rig Veda is recited. He might have a vague idea of it. So the question is, these people could have been quite isolated and they were just re-assimilated, re-brought forward into the limelight because they were useful. They had rituals that would allow the Brahmins to cement a political relationship with the kings who they needed in order to go all the way across North India to Assam and all the way south to the bottom of Maharashtra. But I'm going to explain to us the role of the Nabutris and how they landed up in Kerala and where they came. Okay, I actually looked at Kerala not because I wanted to make it difficult for myself. I didn't know Malayalam at the time. I had to get help. Basically, I wanted to see what happens when a small group of almost exclusively male Brahmins comes into a new area. What kind of situation do you find, partly in terms of uh, how do they preserve the text? How do they assimilate? A lot of things happen. For example, we're quite sure that if the Nambudris came to Kerala in the 8th century, they weren't speaking Sanskrit as a mother tongue. It was no one's mother tongue at that time. So what were they speaking? We simply do not know. So similarly, we can accept that we simply don't know what the Vedic Brahmin men were speaking up in the Indus Valley just after the Harappan uh, civilization declined. So we... I looked at that. I also wanted to get a picture of what kind of mixing happens in the population. And it's exactly as I expected. It's the male of the Brahmin integrating with the female of what's local. It's, it's what I would have predicted based on the fact that they were almost all men. But there is, in fact, historical, recent historical evidence in Kerala of uh, Nair women. And um, Nambudri men and the, the children being accepted as Nayars and a large number of Nayars being knowing their part Nambudri. So I wanted to see if we matched a very similar situation, if it would shed light on the early Vedic Brahmins in the Northwest and um, also give us a picture of how important or unimportant they were in the larger society. It's possible that quite a lot happened oblivious of them. So you, you end up with one very interesting statement, which I had marked in your book as well, which is that uh, Sanskrit was nobody's mother tongue. Oh, uh, maybe not. In, maybe in the beginning it was. If it's not your mother tongue, if by which I mean the language that before the age of five you were speaking BB talk and all, then it's a second language, even if it's a very good second language. I'm speaking very good second language English, so are you. It doesn't mean it's bad at all, but a language which only has second language speakers is not a language with vitality that's capable of evolving in surprising directions. Sanskrit did that for a while. It did funny things like pick up the very Hindi type past tense with ne. Now, that was an interesting thing to see happen. It meant the language said, most of us actually speak something Indian. And so what if we start saying many kanakaya instead of a straight past tense like you might get in Bengali or Tamil, I ate. I think, you know, some people will push back on the fact that uh, English being a second language, you can't have vitality. I think Salman Rushdie, for example, is great evidence of the fact that you can have it as a second language and yet bring another vitality to the language. Okay, now you get into another topic. No, the difference no, no, no. between bilingualism and diglossia. Yeah, we will we'll we'll talk to that, but I want to I want to move sort of historically All right. in, gate, well, uh, in your book and move into uh, the link between Persian and Urdu. Uh, there is sort of, you know, almost a political sense uh, which you refer to in your book that after partition there was this attempt to to draw a sharp line between Urdu and Hindi. 
And almost as if to say, yeah, yeah. The British almost. Yeah, it began all that, but it's increased subsequently. Mm. And almost as if to say that, oh, well, Urdu is basically a Persian language, and Hindi is some sort of derivative of uh, of Sanskrit, which of course your book makes clear, and it isn't. So I'd like you to spend a few minutes talking to us about um, what influence Persian had uh, on the languages of India and the relationship between Persian, Hindi, and Urdu. Let me put two things together and it'll become clearer. Let's look at Malayalam together with Urdu. Both of them, you would never say that Malayalam is a Sanskrit language. But in exactly the same way, Malayalam and Urdu only took nouns out of the lexifier language, which is to say, Persian gave it nouns. No verbs, I don't see any verbs. Sanskrit came into Malayalam as nouns. Where are the verbs? That is as light a touch as you can get. Because when you think of things like Hindi, Bengali, Marathi, it took everything, even its postpositions, um, all kinds of funny little endings and so out of the Prakrits, adapting it to the way it wanted. Every single little thing came. Word for mother, word for father. I mean, you're adopting a whole new uh, system of meaning. Now, whereas with Urdu, this thing came in slowly at the time of Amir Fosro when it was only spoken and writing was only in Persian. You would get the occasional word, Darya. It's pretty word, so this was used. But the intense amount of Persian came in only in the 1700s when for political reasons, a few Zazal writers in Hyderabad. So Hyderabad thinks it started Urdu. Yes, literary Urdu, but not spoken Urdu. Um, they started writing in Urdu the way that they wrote in Persian before. They said, I'm we writing for a new audience, exactly like the Nambudri said. We're not writing in Sanskrit anymore. Our epics will be written in Malayalam. So they got a new version, which they called Mani Pravalam, which is with a lot of Sanskrit words, just like you got Rehta, Urdu, which is with a lot of Persian words, all of them nouns, maybe an adjective or two, a verb or two, but almost like 90-something percent nouns. That's a very light touch. It's a way of saying that now we're going out into the snow, we'll wear a coat. It's the same as... So I, do, I just want you then to dwell a little bit on where did this Urdu come from? Where where was the word matrix? Yeah, the matrix on which Persian words were imposed. Where did this matrix? Okay, before the year seventeen eighty, it wasn't even called Urdu. It was called Hindi. Now that should tell you the answer. It's a language of Delhi, which was at least around in the twelve hundreds and possibly before that. We obviously are forced to go by the written record. My guess is that a lot of these things were around for a few hundred years before we had evidence of them, because I don't know why they would have suddenly just sprung up in the 12th century. I'm saying Hindi, Marathi, the Hindi as in Del Delhi Hindi, not Braj, not Avadhi. I'm guessing that, uh, this is my new hypothesis, that a lot of these languages have been around for hundreds of years before they came into the written record because people, a different kind of person was writing, a shopkeeper, a lawyer, not just a king or a Brahmin. So suddenly they wrote in what they knew and probably had been speaking in for a long time. So Urdu is Hindi and it was known as Delavi to distinguish it from Braj, Kanaj, Avadhi. So yeah, they're the same language. Haven't you ever spoken to somebody in Kashmir or in Pakistan and had them in the same language? language. They call it Urdu and we call it Hindi and my father used to call it Hindustani and they're all the same language. I think it's easy to a linguist. We look at the bedrock, the basic grammatical structure and the basic vocabulary. And they are the same. It's just the earrings are different. The little coat you wear is different. Do you wear a hat? These are so external to the actual essence of the language. 
that it's just a way of saying they're different from us. Yes, they're socially different. Maybe you don't mix. Maybe they are becoming more different than they used to be much more together with you. But the point is that Hindi and Urdu are not different. The word Urdu came up in a particular ghazal in 1780 by Mushafi, who was from Lucknow. Um, the word itself is a word that is Uzbek, one of the five or six Uzbek words I can name. Here's another example. When the, when the uh, Mughals and the Sultanate came to India, like the Namudris, like the Vedic Brahmins, all these mostly men types, threw away whatever they spoke before. In their case, we know it was Uzbek. And the word Urdu was not the name of the language then. And you still have people in Bengal talking about so-and-so is an Ujbuk. An Ujbuk meaning... Gawar is no, he's that basically stupid. Idea being, he was one of the migrants from Central Asia, not elite enough to be speaking Persian. They spoke Persian the way we speak English. And we know Hindi and we know English. You and I are speaking English now. They even Babur in his original Babur Nama, quite a bit of it is in Persian, even though it's considered. You know, in, in Uzbekistan, they don't think of Babur as the emperor of India. They think of them as the first great Uzbek writer. Wow. So, during this period, during the Mughal period, what you are telling me is that Persian was the language of the court. Yes. Just to Sanskrit was the language of exactly. literature and religion. And at the same time, you had rest of the people using some form of Hindi or Delhi or whatever you want yeah. to call it. And over a period of time, that got enriched by sounds largely from Persian, but the structure of the language became didn't change. Then. Yeah, and it was variously called Telugu, Hindi, whatever. And it seems to be different. Hindi was the term for anything that was Indian and not Persian. It could be Gujarati. Okay, 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 okay. And today you have a situation where. Something which is as remote as Guj Purif is called a dialect of as you make the point that it could equally be called a dialect of Magadhi. It is a definitely a Magadhan language. Um I, I'm a native speaker of Bhojpuri. So you got me on my exact happy home ground. I uh, well, you. Um Bhojpuri and Marwari. Marwari to me sounds just like Gujarati with a twist. And I know that if I listen to any language further to the east, be it Bengali, be it Assamese, be it Nagamese, be it Oriya, from Bhojpuri, I can get a feel for it almost instantly. Um, but the reason is that what decides whether your language is a dialect of this or or a dialect of that or a language on its own is all it's political. It's not linguistic. And for quite a long time, Gojpuri had, the same way we have Hindi for trivial things, English for important things, well, they had Gojpuri for trivial things in the village and Hindi for the important things. It was part of the larger Hindi belt. So when Hindi started moving and collecting territories, okay, Gojpuri, poor, poor souls, they were not very, they didn't have a literature or anything, but look at People like Braj and Avati, they were way ahead of Hindi. They're still called dialects of Hindi because, and what did Hindi have over all of them? It was based in the capital city. That accounts for everything. To stay with the theme of politics, uh, you mentioned that politics played a major role, creating this divide between Urdu and Hindi, specifically the politics of the British. And you mark the year 1900 as being a significant year. And that can you tell us something about it? Today, probably 1930s as such. Um, we, we, do, we all know about Macaulay. Basically, what happened is, imagine the British coming in here as new boyfriend. And they see old boyfriend's clothes all over the apartment. All the Persian words. All the Persian words in the legal system, in the administrative system, it's working well. But they can't bear the sight of it. So they felt, and they made a, a leap of thought, which if they knew a bit more, they wouldn't have done. 
they thought that if they could possibly take these Persian words out of Hindi, they would get something that was there before. So they actually sat and took them out, not knowing that there's only one language in India which took its words directly from Sanskrit, and that's Malayalam. All the others took them from local Prakrits. So what they should have had to do is go back to the local Prakrit, which is why, for example, Bengali, Marathi, Hindi, and the various others don't quite look alike. It's not just local differences. The Prakrit that fed into their words was not the same Prakrit. So when the Brits pushed it straight into Tatsama Sanskrit, they were behaving as though Malayalam was the model. And that's really crazy because now we know that that's what made Hindi look so suddenly strange. It was not meant to have Sanskrit directly and not for every little thing. You could have it as new things, but not old words replacing. You what? have that lovely example in the book about uh, restricted access. Pratibhandit Kshetra. Yeah. Which, as you said, is like a direct translation of yeah. uh, the English restricted area. Restricted. Yeah. Now, whereas the Hindi would say, which yeah. explains it so, so, so great. Differently, yeah. Tells you what and to that, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which sort of underlines what you said, which is that Sanskrit is nobody's other tongue. No, this is not really even Sanskrit. This basically short Hindi is the British attempt to take Sanskrit words as though they were playing with the Latin they learned in school and use it to translate syllable by syllable the English things they wanted to be in Hindi. Now, Sanskrit exists. Um, the early Sanskrit of the Rig Veda was clearly someone's mother tongue then, but by the time it was, it's like saying Latin is whose mother tongue. The way I hear Latin pronounced now, or the when I hear 15th century Latin being done, the damn thing feels like Italian. By the time you reach the last hymn of the Rig Veda, my Hindi antenna are working better for me than my Sanskrit antenna for understanding it. And strangely, it's not that just the Brits that did it, there have been from time to time spurts of this new enthusiasm for a Sanskritized Hindi in post-colonial, in independent India, again trying to coin these words which would seem to find adoption. No, because it's a fake thing. It's like me saying I'm going to put together a robot of this part, this part, this part, this part, this on alive. That thing called life is something that's very hard to define and many and languages, too, have something called life. Uh, it can be brought back to life. But bringing something back to life is also a political statement. Why do you want it alive suddenly? Yeah, no, it's clearly political. So I want to jump into it. I want to jump into it. And with this statement that you make, which is that independence marked a watershed in the life of English in India. Yes. How did this happen? You had, Pur you had Sanskrit, you had Persian, which were the languages of the ruler. Yeah. You out of faded away. You had English, which was languages of the ruler, which became stronger when the Brits left. Well, it's like um, people like our Mamaji, who I based my Sanskrit metaphor on, or our very own Manmohan Singh. Look at them in their day, growing up as small children. They were taught in... Persian. They were taught Persian and Urdu, not Hindi, not Gurmukhi. So you will notice that whenever Manmohan Singh had to read from the teleprompter, he suddenly became lyrical when the thing was written in Urdu. When it was in Devanagari, he was peering at it and struggling and decoding it. So he's not part of the Mughal uh, families. He's not Uzbek. He's not Muslim. Same with our mama. It was just that they were educated and elite and boys. So there was something that happened, not merely um, elite, but male. So in Sanskrit, men knew Sanskrit. Women did not. Even if they knew it, they must pretend they didn't. 
and similarly Persian. English, um, some of that has gone a bit, but India was very comfortable with the idea that elites had a language to themselves, which was like an automatic reservation. And English grew into that new role. Earlier, we had people like we all have grandfathers, or, or even you and I are of an age group, it can be our parents, who liked Hindi or Punjabi or Marathi or Bengali better and would walk up to a sign which was bilingual and read the Indian one, not the English one. And that changed. Now, at some point, these old men, men, not even women, that is part of the old thing, men who were baboos, they were bilingual. Bilingual means that what they could do in their Indian language was quite similar to what they could do in their English. They could read the same poetry, similar poetry. They could do technical work in both. At the time of independence, two things happened about probably the same thing. One is that um, we started having schools, primary schools in English medium. So the whole elite section of society appropriated this as a marker, something that would be so easy for it and that others would have a very great difficulty in doing. So that happened. And let me remember go back to what I was about to say. Um, so when you suddenly decide that English is going to be your language, it ceases to be a bilingual situation. Bilingual means if you had to walk up to a mechanic in the U.S., it wouldn't come to you in the first moment how to tell him what to do in English. You know English. You are used to speaking to mechanics in Hindi. Now, what began to happen in India is it was a single language competence. Salman Rushdie is part of that generation. He knows one language, which is at the bottom level is Hindi or Urdu, and at the top level it is English. It's uh, my metaphor I love to give is the Alfonso language tree, that you have this sturdy local root digging into Indian soil and you speak to your grandmother, your grandfather, the poor people around you when you're a small child before the age of five. Then you get into school and you lock off the plant, put a graft, bind it very tightly, and you have a graft line. And from then on, all the fruits and flowers from that tree are not the same as the rootstock. So it's a single tree. And it is definitely fed from the soil via those roots, but it's not two trees that complement each other. It's a single tree. So there's some things you can do in Hindi because that's its role. And there's some things like if I asked you to answer questions on philosophy, you would find yourself thinking, how do I say this? Which you'd never have to say to a mechanic. So suddenly diglossia, this is diglossia. Diglossia is when it's two languages, but it's not bilingualism. It's they behave like a single language with distributed rules according to what activity you're in. What prevented the resurgence of uh, Hindi and that becoming the language of uh, power of a common language, as happened, for example, in Malaysia or in Malaysia or Thailand, I mean, several countries which were common. What was so peculiar about India that uh, English became the language of power and not Hindu? Okay, Indonesia is a wonderful example because it's as varied as India. It had a few things we didn't have. One, it was conquered by the Japanese. So the Dutch were moved out for a certain number of years during the freedom struggle. So there were people who were thinking, what local language could we use? Because we have these ornate local languages, which are like very fancy Urdu, and nobody wanted to move to someone else's language. They thought of this thing similar to what we call Hindustani. And it, but it wasn't working out until the Japanese came and 
basically got rid of Dutch. Now, supposing we were conquered by the Japanese and they said, you have two choices, Indian language or Japanese, we would have chosen an Indian language. And it would not have been the most difficult. That's where we went terribly wrong with Hindi. The people who wanted to own Hindi and design it and put Sanskrit into it had a terrible ulterior motive. They wanted something they knew best. And that would be difficult for other people. They couldn't get out of that. Whereas in Indonesia, they took something that was so easy, not even from that country, it was Malay. Mahasa Indonesia is actually Malay. They took something that was so easy that it could be made even easier if a foreigner had changed it. And they knew it would grow into its rule. And I don't know if that is the way we should go. Uh, I tend to think that it's a very complicated thing, but that at the very least, we shouldn't be pushing small children into learning a language which is which so disassociates them with poor children from their part of India. You could even even Macaulay didn't want to do that. Macaulay said in class eight, you make the decision whether you're moving to English and getting into civil services and engineering and so. We didn't do that. We said, okay, let the kind of kids who can speak English from the age of three um, be educated in that. And then all the elites said, how can you have science in Hindi? How can you have it in Tamil? How could you have it in Bengali? And that's when, in fact, you could. Um, I sent my daughter to a school, just Hindi medium for the junior school time, SPV. She's not different from anyone else now. She knows as much English as anyone else. Um, and she probably met a larger section of children because she knew good Hindi for a very long time until she was about 11. So, you're the counterfactual. She was okay. in the state schools. Oh. Um, they taught kids in the local night. Yeah. Uh, but increasing parents have taken kids out of those schools and put them into budget private schools. Yeah. With one primary motive, which is they must learn English. Yeah, because English is basically the gatekeeper, which decides whether you will get a good job. That job may just be something as soul killing as being a courier or working for Swiggy or doing something that requires minimal English. Their parents have made the choice that one generation is going to have to make that change for us. It's because we've created a society where if you don't know English, you have no chance of the best jobs, even the second order best jobs. Um, let me see, take it back. You asked me uh, why they're taking their kids out of the school. I think parents don't know what their kids are going through. I know my driver's daughter, he put his daughter, was very bright, in a state school. Yep. Hindi medium. At some point, I think by secondary school, they decided that they were good enough to teach an English medium with the same textbooks as private schools. But guess what happened? You know English, but you don't do it quite well enough to be sure you understand what you're supposed to be teaching. So the teacher would tell Monica, stand up, read one para. She'd read one para and sit down, no discussion, no explanation. So they were going through the motions of a code, which is just English, and not learning the very important stuff that was behind it. And nobody understood that the very simplest thing they needed to do, if they were not willing to do more, was to at least put the explanation for the teacher in the local language too. Uh, it means we have the worst of both worlds. Yeah. We have made English into that thing that if you can get past it, the kingdom of God is with you. The Japanese didn't do that. The Russians didn't do that. All sorts of other people didn't do that. And then the Iranians are way ahead of us in terms of as a proportion of their population. One third of their paper presenters at science conferences, hijabed and all, are women. Now, in a way, we have 
made it we've taken the most um superficial thing out of the modern english speaking world english and not considered that the children need to understand the material and that if they understood it until the age of 11 or so after that you can do quite a lot with them you could even shift them to english but once the poor decide that they don't need hindi or okay, tamil or bengali or marathi they're going to go they will die. they will vanish we're going to be like the philippines or south africa oh dear well one can only hope that we uh, take our place in uh, inventing new strains of this language and enriching this before we close uh, peki i want to ask you what are you reading what am i reading i'm not reading so much except a little bit to get my mind off things i just read a book by somebody i met at a lit fest which is called wild and what and willful a book on animals because animals and and the the environment is a very close metaphor of the indian languages and their environment but i'm also constantly thinking about where i take this further i'm looking at more situations in india where languages mix right now i'm about to take a plane for hyderabad to look and see what is there in the history who these people were who made this dakini language i want to go at some point to nepal to find out how a language could be so different from everything you think can happen in north india because it seems to have a dakbil platypus mix of western north india and eastern north india so i'm still inside the book trying to refine it into a model which will allow me to look then deeper into the past cuz is quite a lot of past in india we can go back 65000 years as a first step we enjoy enjoy the dakkan enjoy the language enjoy the food and thanks so much thank you it's been a pleasure for more such podcasts articles trivia and interesting bits of information from the world of history heritage arts and culture make sure to visit thisday.app you can also check out the thisday app on google play store and ios app store